it's important to, again, understand that the Great Depression really was a major event in U.S. history. Right? It's, um, it was a watershed, watershed moment in a sense that everything changed after the Great Depression. Um, the role that Americans assigned to the federal government changed. The view that uh, Americans had of a market economy, of the U.S., it all changed. Right? So it's really important to have a deeper understanding of what actually transpired during the Great Depression. And unfortunately, it's only economists that really care anymore. Most people are not interested. Um, they just, they know what, they, they think they know what they know, and they're quite happy with that. But we're going to go a little bit further, all right? So um, the usual explanation, and you, of course you got these kinds of things quite a lot back then, you know, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of despair, a lot of desperation for sure, right? Um, anybody know how high the unemployment was uh, during the worst of the Great Depression? 25%. But that's an unbelievably high rate of unemployment, right? One out of every four people is unemployed. And by the way, that doesn't mean that they're out there not working. That just means that they're looking for work. There are a whole bunch of people that are not looking for work, right? They may be engaged in what economists call household production, right? They may just be taking care of kids or taking care of the household. Um, and they're not looking for a, an official job, right? Um, they're not counted as unemployed. They're counted as not being a part of the labor force. To be counted as unemployed, you have to be actively looking for work. You see? So the people, um, they were actively looking for work, but unable to find work was, they consisted of one out of every four Americans. That's a pretty devastating number. Okay? So the usual explanation is what we just talked about. It was caused by the stock market crash of October 1929. And um, the, the crash, the stock market crash and then the subsequent depression are due to inherent um, problems with the market uh, system, right, capitalism. And Frederick Delano Roosevelt saved us from the Great Depression, right? That's all, often part of the, the normal narrative. And that he, in fact, saved capitalism from itself by expanding the role of the government, right? How many of you heard uh, some version of this? All right, almost all of you, right? So that's the standard narrative. Um, now, a lot of the narrative was actually also shaped by this guy, John Maynard Keynes, right? So Keynes is undoubtedly one of the most, if possibly the most influential economist of the 20th century. Uh, there, economists talk about the Keynesian revolution that happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. And that is really not an overstatement. It's not an exaggeration. There was a Keynesian revolution that took place during that time. Now, Keynes had been a, a renowned, respected economist before the Great Depression. You know, going all the way back to the end of World War I, he had written a great deal. He had been influential. Um, but his most influential work came in 1936, the general theory, right? In general theory, the general theory, Keynes sets out to completely remake modern economics. Um, he s comes up with a completely, what he thinks, actually it's not quite true, but what he thinks of as a completely new way of doing economics. It's what we now refer to as macroeconomics. All right, so if you've taken some basic economics courses, um, macroeconomics is pretty much, a big chunk of that is going to be Keynesian economics. Though there have been you know, a great deal of critiques of that and that I would hope would be incorporated into the course as well. But basically, macroeconomics is Keynesian economics. And today, we have the so-called neoclassical synthesis, which says, well, Keynesian economics, macroeconomics works in the short run, but microeconomics is how we explain long run phenomena. That's not how Keynes thought about it. To Keynes, microeconomics was just nonsense. He dismissed it completely. He referred to it as classical economics, and to him that was 
a term or a pejorative term, like, oh, nobody should believe this nonsense anymore, right? But think about this. This book comes out in 1936. How long had the Great Depression lasted at that point? Seven years. Things are not working. So it's maybe not, we can't blame him too much for saying, listen, all this microeconomic stuff that shows um, that markets work, prices adjust, none of that's happening. We need to rethink this. Okay? Um, and he rethinks it by, first of all, rejecting the concept of spontaneous order. Right? So the whole idea of spontaneous order, which goes back to Adam Smith, the Scottish Enlightenment, people like David Hume, right? all of them say it's not necessary for the government to control the economy. Order will happen as an unintended consequence, unplanned consequence of our individual self-interested actions. Right? Order will happen spontaneously. And that was the core part of classical economics from Adam Smith all the way until um, Keynes. Some economists maybe didn't like it that much. They would be critical of it. But in general, that was part of the hard core of, um, of economics. Keynes says, nope, it's not happening. We have to stop thinking that there is such thing as spontaneous order. To him, to Keynes, it's all about the demand side of the economy. To all, I shouldn't say all, but the majority of um, pre-Keynesian economists, they were supply siders. They thought about the supply side, the production side, as running the economy. And they thought about the business cycle um, as um, probably Bob Murphy talked about um, in his lecture on business cycle, as a, a, um, a discoordination, a failure to coordinate. Right? That's why you have a business cycle. There is a failure of coordination. Keynes says, no. It's the matter, it's a matter of insufficient demand for products. Businesses are not producing stuff and therefore not hiring people because nobody's buying stuff. Okay? So to Keynes, what drives the economy is aggregate expenditures. Aggregate expenditures, and to him, these aggregate expenditures are inherently unstable in a market economy because investors are driven by what he calls animal spirits. And animal spirits to Keynes, um, again, this is not a nice thing. This is the result of irrational behavior of investors. That investors are prone to herd-like behavior. You know, if you've ever seen the video of a herd of buffalo plunging off a cliff, right, where they're just like all following each other and not paying attention to where they're going, and they go over the cliff and plummet into their certain death. Um, that's kind of the way Keynes thought about investors, that they are highly emotional, highly irrational, and prone to following the herd. You see, that's what he meant by animal spirits. Now think about this. Here's how Keynes thought about aggregate expenditures. This formula, this very simple formula, how many of you have seen this formula before? Great, pretty much all of you, almost all of you. But it says aggregate expenditures equal personal consumption plus private investment plus government expenditures, right? You can usually also put net exports in there, but we're gonna simplify it right now. That doesn't play a very large role. Um, government expenditures, and there should be S there. And um, consumption investment and uh, government expenditures. And the problem here is that pessimism on the part of investors will have a significant impact, not just on one, but on two of these variables. Where does it start? Which variable will be affected first by animal spirits becoming irrationally pessimistic. Investment. Right, private investment. So private investment are the expenditures made by businesses on 
factories, on machines, right? Trucks, all of that kind of stuff. Anything that's necessary for production. And if businessmen become very pessimistic, they're going to start decreasing their expenditures on investment goods, on capital goods. Okay? But notice as they do that, they're probably also going to start decreasing the hiring, right? Because if they say, oh, the future is looking pretty dim, we need to cut back on all of these capital expenditures, they probably need to cut down the labor expenditures too. And so they're going to start laying people off. Which variable will that affect? Personal consumption. So people start losing jobs, their income goes down. If their income goes down, um, they will not be spending as much. So the Keynesian explanation is that these animal spirits first drive down private investment, triggering a decline in personal consumption. And so it's like this downward spiral where then consumers start becoming much more pessimistic. And as they start becoming pessimistic, they actually cut back on consumption even further. They start saving money rather than spending it. Okay? Um, and aggregate expenditures plummet. In Great Depression, that's what caused the problems, is that we were permanently stuck at this low level of aggregate expenditures, according to Keynes, right? That there was no mechanism to get us out of that um, you know, too low aggregate expenditures, too low level of aggregate expenditures. What's the solution, according to Keynes? There is no spontaneous order. There is no self-corrective mechanism. We are at way too low of expenditures. People are pessimistic. They continue to be pessimistic. They're not spending. Neither businessmen nor private households. Massive unemployment. What's the solution, according to Keynes? Exactly. That should be pretty obvious. If these two are going down, and yes, I'm making the devil sign with my hands here, because this is devil's work, folks. Um, so when consumption and investment go down, the obvious solution is for the government expenditures to go up, right? To counter the decline in aggregate expenditures caused by the private sector. How does the government do that? Spending money, not just spending, but taxing, right? So the government needs to tax and spend. Um, so how it arranges its tax and spending decisions will have an impact on G, right? Or um, through taxation, if it, let's say, lowers taxes on households or it lowers taxes on businesses, um, businesses and households will then spend more, right? So, in fact, Keynes was for cutting taxes in times of recessions or certainly depressions. He thought that it was really important. That was one tool that the government can use, one tool of fiscal policy. But the other, and more, much more important uh, tool of fiscal policy to him was what? Spending in general, right? So he thought that it was very important for government to engage in massive increase in spending. And spending that's not necessarily paid for by higher taxes. He thought if you try, if the government tries to increase spending at the same time it's increasing taxes, that's going to be counterproductive. So it needs to actually spend money that it's not taken in through taxes. How can it do that? Borrowing. Borrowing. Yeah, it, to run deficits, budget deficits. To Keynes, those budget deficits were only supposed to be uh, run during the crisis. And as soon as the crisis was over, he wanted the government to run a budget surplus where it would take in more money than it spent and then pay down the debt. He was very naive in terms of politics, what happens in politics. And it's pretty much impossible to get politicians to not spend money that they have sitting there. It's pretty much impossible to, to get them to not spend money they do, they do not have sitting there. Never mind the money that's actually sitting there. Right? So um, uh, that was a, a serious problem because now you had a 
quote unquote scientific explanation of um, why government needs to spend money. Well, if you're a politician, this is like manna from heaven, right? Somebody's telling you, listen, you have a scientific justification for spending a lot more money. Woohoo! Hallelujah! Right? Um, but the problem, of course, is that it's led to $20 trillion worth of debt that we have right now. That's a direct result of this kind of a Keynesian mindset. And by the way, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office itself, projects that over the next 10 years, it's going to rise by another $10 trillion. And they're usually optimistic about this stuff, right? So the debt is likely to be, uh, by 2025, over $30 trillion. I don't know where that money comes from, because to accumulate the debt, somebody has to actually lend you money. Who has $10 trillion to lend to the federal government? Where is this money going to come from? I don't know. No market mechanism can correct it. It's the government solution. Uh, he also thought that monetary policy could play a role. Monetary policy is when the government prints money. Why does the government print money? What's the point here? Besides paying, its off, paying off its own bills, um, how can it stimulate uh, the economy from this perspective? So like the Federal Reserve, which we're going to talk a lot more about, they lower, uh, sorry, they increase the, the stock of money. They channel all of that money into banks. And banks loan out that money. But in order to loan out all of that money, because they have so much at that point, they're going to have to lower interest rates. Right? And then if they lower interest rates, it'll be cheaper for businesses to borrow, it'll be cheaper for households to borrow, and they're going to borrow and spend more. Right? So that's the mechanism of monetary policy, through increasing the money supply, lowering interest rates, and then causing both C and I to go up. But Keynes didn't really like that as much. He had a whole bunch of reasons why that wouldn't work very well. And he really believed that fiscal policy, in particular the spending part of fiscal policy, was the way to go. Okay? Um, massive influence. So to Keynes, notice, the culprit was the inherent instability of the market system. The culprit was um, markets. Capitalism. That's what got us into the Great Depression. And a lot of people listened, including this guy. I mean, you know, he didn't need much convincing. Um, that's Roosevelt. And um, Keynes was very influential on policymakers, including Roosevelt. Though there was one time where they met and apparently did not go very well. But the fact is that by the time that, um, um, by 1936 or so, uh, 37, Roosevelt started adopting exactly what Keynes was saying. He started acting in ways that um, uh, Keynes certainly would have approved of. So it became accepted that government must engage in what's called counter-cyclical policy, right? That the government engages in fiscal and monetary policy that goes against the cycle. So if the, if the, the business cycle, right? So if the um, economy is going into recession, the government needs to stimulate, expand, um, monetary and fiscal policy. If the economy is overheating going into inflation, then uh, the government needs to apply the brakes, engage in the restrictive fiscal and monetary policy and or monetary policy. Okay? And, um, and along with FDR, Keynes was hailed as a savior of capitalism. You know, that they saved capitalism from itself by allowing the government to actually stabilize the Unst inherently unstable market economy. Okay? That's the standard storyline. Now, here is Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman challenges this entire explanation. Uh, again, one of the great economists of the 20th century. He won a Nobel Prize and uh, was extremely influential. Probably the second most influential economist of the 20th century after Keynes. Uh, and Friedman was a, a very dedicated free market economist. He was, he really, he was a classical liberal. He believed in liberty. And um, especially as he got older, but you know, most of his life. But it got even more intense as he got older. And um, he really finds this whole explanation of the Great Depression problematic. He doesn't like it. 
And in fact, he starts investigating historically what happened in the 1930s, 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and that's actually part of an extremely important book that he co-wrote with Anna Schwartz. Um, it's called The Monetary History of the United States. And uh, this book comes out in 1962, and it's revolutionary. People are just blown away. Um, the stuff on the Great Depression is just one part of the book. It's one chapter of the book. It deals with all sorts of other stuff. But what, he, what Friedman and Schwartz show in that book is that every major crisis in the United States history, going back to the late 18th century, was caused by monetary mismanagement by the US government, by the mismanagement of monetary policy by the US government. That in fact, the recessions and certainly the Great Depression are not caused by inherent instability of the markets. That in fact, they're caused by policy errors of the government, in particular, monetary policy errors. Okay? Now, that was an incredibly bold claim. Economists were blown away. They said, what? No, come on, get out of here. Right? We know what happened with the Great Depression. This is ridiculous. Um, the Federal Reserve, they didn't acknowledge it even for a long time, but they thought it was just ridiculous. They were helpful. The Federal Reserve, by the way, is the central bank of the United States. It's the institution that carries out the monetary policy of the United States. Okay, so all the stuff that we talked about a moment ago. Um, now, the thing is that what Friedman and Schwartz did is they didn't just hypothesize. They, in fact, presented a slew of hard evidence for what they were claiming. And that was very difficult to deny. Okay, so they argued that the Great Depression was not a necessary result of the stock market crash. This standard explanation says, look, that's just ridiculous. And in fact, if you look, we have had many stock market crashes through the US history. The majority of them are not, not only followed by, the great, by a Great Depression, but in fact, most of them are not even followed by a recession. One of the worst stock market crashes came in 1987. And in 1987, there was no recession. There was no recession between 1982 and 1991, a nine-year period. Nothing. Right? It's not necessary for uh, a stock market crash to lead to a recession. You have to look deeper for what the causes are of a recession or a depression, a depression being a severe recession, right? By the way, we define a recession, just uh, to, to mention this, as a period where you have at least six months, two quarters, two consecutive, consecutive quarters, where the GDP is declining, right? Where the economy is shrinking rather than growing. That's what a recession is. And a depression is a very severe recession. Um, how bad was the Great Depression, by the way, just in terms of the shrinking of the economy? Between 1929 and 1933, the GDP had shrunk by 29%. In that four-year period, one-third of the economy disappeared, right? Just went away. A pretty amazing thing, really, to contemplate. That is a shock of massive proportions. No wonder it's going to create these kinds of consequences, such devastating consequences, right? Um, now, Friedman says that the economy could have quickly recovered after the stock market crash if the government had not intervened with, again, a slew of terrible policies. In particular, to him, the main culprit was the monetary policy. That, by the way, is the Federal Reserve of the United States. This is the Board of Governors um, in Washington, DC. And the Board of Governors um, is uh, in control of much of the Feder Federal Reserve System. It was founded in 1913. 
only 16 years before the, the stock market crash of 1929. Before it, the U.S. had not had a central bank of any kind, even a mild central bank, um, for some 75 years. Uh, this, there was uh, the first bank of the United States, um, which operated from, let me think about this, uh, 1795 to 1815. And then I think the second, second bank of the United States, which operated, or 1792 to 1812, something like that. And then the second bank of the United States, which operated from 1816 until 1836. And um, the Congress, in fact, renewed the charter of the Second Bank of the United States. Who killed it? Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson right? Uh, the original populist. He said, no, this is nonsense. This is terrible. In fact, I completely agree. Um, and uh, he killed it. And the United States did not have a central bank between 1830, 1836 and 1913. Right? So a pretty lengthy period. In fact, a period during which the United States grew immensely, right? That's the period where we had the Industrial Revolution. That's the period where the United States actually became a superpower. A superpower in a sense that when the U.S. entered World War I, the entire war changed dramatically and was finished within a year, right? People say, oh, you got to have a central bank. Do we? The U.S. actually did not. Through the period that we, where we saw the greatest amount of growth happen in the U.S. history. Really, in many ways, the greatest amount of innovation, too. A remarkable period of time. Um, but nevertheless, no central bank. Why was the Federal Reserve created in 1913? It was in response to the banking crisis of 1907. We did have occasional banking crises because the federal government was still messing with the banking system. Even without a central bank, they were constantly messing with the banking system. So you would get these occasional banking crises, basically one every 20 years or so. That cycle, by the way, continues. <laughs> it's a Federal Reserve or not. Every 20 years or so, there is another crisis. So watch out for, let me see, 2028. Just 12 more years. Get your money out of that stock market before that. Don't, tell, don't say I didn't warn you. Um, but anyway, uh, in 1907, there was a pretty bad banking crisis. People said, we need a central bank. Look, all of the civilized countries of Europe have a central bank. Britain, they have the Bank of England. The Bank of England can act as a lender of last resort. What does that mean? Anybody know? What's a lender of last resort? Do you guys know what fractional reserve banking is? How many of you know what fractional reserve banking is? Most of you. So the, the way banks work is that they take in deposits, right? So people put money into their checking accounts or their savings accounts. Well, banks don't just sit on that money. What do banks do? They loan out that money, right? And they charge an interest rate. So they charge an interest rate that's uh, higher than the interest rate that they pay you in theory, they used to pay you, not anymore, not for the last uh, eight years. But banks used to pay an interest on your savings accounts and sometimes on your checking accounts. So you as a depositor would get an interest on those savings while um, banks would then loan out that money to businesses, households, right, for whatever reasons, um, and charge a higher interest rate. And the difference between those interest rates would be the revenue for the bank. That's what would, uh, how they would operate. What's a, one major movie in American cultural consciousness that has a bank run? It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life, right. There is this major scene where George Bailey, is that his name? Uh, where you know, he's managing this bank and he finds out that there is a bank run in this bank and he has this impassioned speech uh, trying to convince people to not demand their money because if they demand their money, the bank will go bankrupt. Right? And he says, look, just be patient. Wait. We will get you your money. We just can't do it right now. Right? Um, so that's the kind of stuff that was happening. Now, what Margo was starting to say is that if you have a lender of last resort, like a central bank, they can provide liquidity. They can give money to a bank to get through the bank run, to survive a bank run. That's why the Federal Reserve was created. It was created to be a lender of last resort so we could avoid the banking crises 
like the one in 1907. Right? Where, in fact, it was um, J.P. Morgan, I think, that ended up stepping in and bailing out a bunch of banks. You know, he was very wealthy, so he could do that. Um, but uh, he said, you know, we can't rely on these robber barons to do that. We need to, in fact, um, have a system in place, the Federal Reserve System. So that's how it was created. Um, and it was, it's a banker's bank in that sense, that this is where banks go to get a loan usually a temporary loan to just get them through the hard times, right, to survive. All right, now, designed to stop bank runs, mass withdrawal of bank deposits when people lose confidence in the banking system. Here's the problem with this. If you allow banks to actually go out of business when uh, there is a bank run, it doesn't affect just the bank itself. It doesn't affect just the people that are depositing that money it actually affects something much bigger than that, and that is the money supply. This is the basic measure of the money supply. It's called M1. It's C plus D, currency plus checking deposits. Right? It's whatever you can use to make payment. Obviously, we use currency to make payment. That's just cash, right? But we also use our checking deposits. Credit cards are not in there because they're not money. Credit cards are a short-term loan, right? So when you pay with a credit card, when you pay with a credit card, in fact, it's your credit card company that pays the merchant, the store, right? And they write a check. So money supply has to consist of currency and checking deposits. It's those two things. Here's the thing. When you talk about the fractional reserve banking system, think about what happens with checking deposits. So um, Tavia has a bank. I deposit my money in a bank, $100. Tavia says, well, I'll keep $10 over these reserves, and what are you going to do with the rest? Loan out 90. Loan out 90, right? So you, you loan it out to, I don't know, let's see, what's your name? Julia. Julia, right? What are you going to do with that money? Why, why did you get this loan? <laughs> With $90, good luck. <laughs> but you're going to spend it on something, right? You want to buy something with that, those $90. So you spend that money, and whoever gets that money will probably do what with it? Probably put it in a bank. They could spend it immediately, but they'll probably they will take your check, right? And they're going to deposit the check in their bank. Um, so notice, now there is an increase of $90 of deposits. We had the original $100, right? But now because of this loan, the Tavia's bank made to Julia, and then Julia bought something and paid whoever, right, for, with those $90, that $90 becomes a deposit in another bank. What has happened to the money supply? The money supply has increased. This is what's called multiple expansion of deposits. Deposits are multiplied through the so-called multiple expansion of deposits process, right? Where um, through the fractional reserve system, banks can, in fact, create money because deposits are money. They can create money by making loans. Are you with me? Does this make sense? This is kind of, it's an abstract thing, but it's an incredibly important part of an economy the way the economy runs, right? Um, but what's the problem here? Is that at this point, now you have the opposite system happening. You have a multiple contraction of deposits. When banks go out of business, those deposits are disappearing. They're no longer part of the economic system. Re remember, um, I deposited money in Tavia's bank. I thought I had $100 that I could spend. Gone. I don't have that $100 anymore. Yeah, you took it. Shame on you. <laughs> Unethical behavior. But of course, I don't know who you are, right? I have no idea who Tavia lent this money to, and I have no claim on it anyway. Right? So my checking deposit went up in a puff of smoke. And that happens for a whole lot of people who were all depositors at the failed banks. You see? And so what will happen if you start seeing banks dropping like flies? 
what will happen to the money supply? It will also plummet, right? And when the money supply plummets, you're going to get terrible economic consequences. Contractionary, that's in effect contractionary monetary policy. But contractionary monetary policy, do you, when, you, when, when is a central bank supposed to engage in, in contractionary monetary policy? Is it supposed to do that during a recession or a depression? No. It's only doing it if the economy is overheating. What happens if it does that while you have a recession or a depression? It will make things a lot worse. right? And this is exactly the story of the Great Depression. The Federal Reserve, so you have the situation where the stock market crash happens, and it's a disturbance. It's a disturbance in the force, right? Um, it messes things up. And in particular, who's hit the hardest are the Midwestern farmers. The Midwestern farmers are in a lot of trouble because of the stock market crash. And uh, they can't repay their loans to small Midwestern banks. They can't repay those loans, and they start defaulting on those loans. People get wind that banks, um, that farmers are defaulting on their loans and that the reserves are shrinking, that the assets of banks are shrinking. What's the natural response to getting this news? A run on the bank, exactly. So you start getting, you, there are triggers of, um, um, of bank runs that lead to increasing number of bank failures. There is this wave of contagion of fear, wave of bank failures, wave after wave, um, where people are just panicking. They're in complete panic mode, and they do not want to keep their money in banks anymore. And so there are bank runs after bank runs after bank runs. What is the Fed doing? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're sitting there and watching all of this just happen. The primary role that they were designed to carry out was to act as a lender of last resort. And they utterly fail at carrying out that role. They just watch this unfold. And as it all unfolds, the money supply is just going down, 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 down. What they should have done is engage in some kind of expansionary monetary policy to try to stabilize this. How many of you know this thing? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. How many of you heard that quote? How many of you thought that it was related to like fighting the Japanese in World War II? Nope. It had everything to do with the banking crisis. So, most of this banking crisis happened from 1930 um, until 1932. FDR is elected in 1932, right? The biggest, most pressing issue he has when he becomes president is the banking crisis. And so he, he has these fireside chats where he would talk over the radio, which was pretty innovative at that time. You know, radio is this newfangled thing. Um, and uh, he tells people, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Why? Because it's a mental state <clears throat> with fractional reserve banking. A bank run only happens if you start panicking, if we start overreacting, right? So he's trying to calm people down. Don't engage in these bank runs. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In World War II, you know, the Japanese were something to fear. I think it was pretty sensible to fear the Japanese and the Germans. Not the Italians. No, never mind. Um, but, um, you know, it was sensible to fear these things. This is a crazy quote if you're talking about World War II. It sounds really bold, right? Courageous, but it's nonsensical. But it's not nonsensical when it comes to um, uh, the banking crisis, you see? And um, it's in, he says it in response to this contagion of fear that's taking over the United States. So these, you have these failing banks mostly in the Midwest, right? Complete and utter abrogation of the responsibilities of the Fed. Why did the Fed do this? The answer is, we don't know. We still don't know. 
Um, the Fed was an incredibly secretive institution. It still is to a large degree, but back then it was completely non-transparent. Nobody knew what they were thinking, what they were, what they were doing. People didn't even know. Right? They were given an immense amount of power to control the, the monetary policy of the United States, but they were not accountable to Congress. They were not accountable to the President of the United States. They were not accountable to anybody, which is a very non-democratic idea, by the way, right? that you have this institution which is all populated by experts, the, the elite, right? and that's going to run our lives because you guys have no idea how much your lives are affected by monetary policy. Huge degree. I'm being Trumpian now. Huge, huge, right? Um, massive influence of monetary policy. Um, um, but he, here are possible reasons for why this happens. First of all, lack of understanding. I mean, the Fed really did not understand what they were doing. They didn't get it at all. And they, they would admit that now. They really were completely clueless to the effects of monetary policy. And in fact, they acted to raise interest rates several times during this period. And you go, man, that's like the stupidest thing you can do. So they clearly didn't get it. What else? Maybe self-interest of the Federal Reserve officials, the Fed, right? Um, because they're mostly connected to larger banks. And failures were mostly at smaller banks early on. So they thought maybe, oh, this is wiping out the competition. Yay, you know, because you don't stay at the Fed forever. You get out of the Fed and you go back into the banking sector, right? That's the way these guys work. Um, maybe there was political conflict because we have like a decentralized central bank in the United States. It's quite unique. So you have the Board of Governors, which is in Washington, D.C., and then you have all of these different Federal Reserve district banks. There is one in San Francisco, in fact. Um, so they're all, and there are 12 of them all together, and they are often at odds. At this point, the Board, board of Governors completely dominates. Um, you know, they're in control. But um, back then, that was not quite the case. So maybe some of these things happen. But look at the consequences. Starting before the banking crisis, we had 25,000 banks, which is an insanely large number, by the way. That's a result of terrible banking policies that we had in the United States prior to this, but that's a different topic. Um, until, until FDR becomes president, 7,000 of those banks close. Um, FDR institutes this thing called the bank holiday, where he basically lets banks not pay deposits back. Right? If you are a depositor and you go to the bank and decide, I'd like my money, the bank says, sorry, can't do, and nothing happens. There is no bank failure. Right? So he institutes this. Um, 12,000 banks reopen initially, 3,000 more eventually. The total loss by the time the banking crisis um, comes to an end is 10,000 banks out of 25,000 go out of business. Now, mostly are small banks. Mostly they are small banks. But as a result, the money supply falls 27% in these four years, right? For every $3 in 1929, only $2 are left in 1933. Look at the similarity between these numbers. GDP falls by 29% during that same period, right? Um, it didn't need to happen. Here's what Friedman and Schwartz say. If the pre-1914, so pre-Federal Reserve System, a banking system, rather than the Federal Reserve System had been in existence in 1929, the money stock almost certainly would not have undergone a decline comparable to the one that occurred. They look at 1907, and they say, look, in 1907, banks actually just stopped paying out this money, and things stabilized pretty quickly. Um, and in particular, there is one other thing that, um, so the Great Depression result of botched monetary policy. The Federal Reserve did not do its uh, job. Larry White, he's a good friend of mine. And what he points out is the, the, the following. The Fed, having nationalized the roles of clearinghouse associations. Clearinghouses are what clears checks between banks. So, you know, if uh, Julia here paid, um, you know, somebody with uh, the, her check, the check had to be cleared to back to Tavia's bank. You see? So um, that's what we mean by a clearinghouse. 
That used to be private. The Federal Reserve takes over that, right? And then particularly the lender of the last resort role, it used to be that these clearing houses, private clearing houses, they would carry out this lender of last resort function. It was privately done. And it worked pretty well. But because it was the Federal Reserve, they did less to mitigate the panic than the clearing houses associations would have done in earlier panics like 1907 and 19, 19, 1893. Right? So the point is that the Fed was the culprit. It was the main reason why the Great Depression happened. How many of you got that story in your history classes or economics classes? Wow. Impressive. Three. Yay. Maybe there is progress. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't all. The perfect storm of bad policies. Let me just go through these very quickly. Um, Hoover passes the Smooth-Hawley Tariff Act, raises tariffs by more than 50% on a slew of products. What do you think the other countries do? They retaliate. And they raise tariffs um, by a large amount themselves. And all of a sudden, international trade almost completely comes to a stop. Now, the U.S. was exporting a great deal of stuff at that point. What happened to all the companies that were producing stuff for exports? Gone. A disastrously bad policy. And this is what Trump wants to do, by the way. Right? Um, this is what Keynes was aghast at. Keynes couldn't believe this. Government, the federal government passes the largest tax increase in history. It increases taxes, uh, uh, marginal tax rates across the board by 150%. Because the idea is that we have to balance the budget. But what happened to government revenues in 1930, 31, 32? They plummeted because it, they, that's what happens every time in a recession. Right? There is a lot less business activity, so there is a lot less tax tax revenues you're going to take in. And the government responds by massively raising taxes. And Keynes says, that's the worst thing you can do. But everybody says that's like a really dumb thing to do. I, you have to be a special sort of dumb to think that by ra massively raising taxes in the middle of this terrible crisis is going to have anything but a disastrously bad effect. Right? Um, that wasn't all. They again do it in 1937 under FDR. Huge increase. Marginal tax rates go up to 90%. 90% for a while. Then FDR, some of the first things that he did are the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So you have, what do you think is happening to prices as a result of a decline in the money supply? What do we call that? deflation, right? The opposite of inflation. So there is massive deflation. And FDR says we, we can stop deflation completely oblivious to the actual cause of deflation, which is a huge drop in the money supply, right? He says what we need to do is we need to pay farmers to kill off their pigs and cattle and to bury under their um, uh, crops, destroy their crops. So there is mass mass scale destruction of um, uh, animals and crops to try to increase prices. So you're in this situation where the economy is completely tanking, people are starving, and you're paying farmers to destroy food. Yeah, that's smart thinking there. Right? NIRA, N -I -R -A, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which created a national industrial, or the National Recovery Administration. And the National Recovery Administration legally forces all, mar all industries to form a cartel. And this cartel decides how much each, each business is going to be allowed to produce of a particular product and what price it's going to be allowed to charge. If you go against that price, you will go to prison. There was a tailor, he was told, you have to charge 25 cents to fix the suit. He charged 20 cents. He ended up going to prison for six months. Okay? We had a fascist economy for a while. 
What happened to the National Recovery Administration? The Supreme Court struck it down. Um, FDR was so angry that he threatened to do what? Pack the court. Add another, what was it, five justices, six, whatever it was, right? So he would have a majority on the Supreme Court. There was a massive public backlash. People flipped out. And he didn't do it, right? But you look at all of these things, and then finally, the public works programs, these public works projects, like carving faces of dead presidents into a side of a mountain. Mount Rushmore, yeah, let's employ thousands of people for something entirely useless. Because this is going to help. Let's plant trees. Where does the money for that come from? Oh, we're going to raise taxes. We're removing all of these massive amount of people from the labor force in order to do these things, which really had no immediate value. Um, massively distorting the labor market. The number of stupidities when it piled so high and deep that it is really mind-boggling. How many things the federal government got wrong during the 1930s. But it all started with the mismanaged monetary policy. If that hadn't happened, FDR would not have, maybe would not have been even elected and would not have passed all of those things. Um, maybe Hoover had, would not have done all these stupid things either. It was the, the initial monetary policy errors that triggered everything. Now, um, so the Great Depression is not the result of market forces. Interestingly enough, what um, Friedman says in Free to Choose, the myth that private enterprise, including the private banking system, had failed in the Great Depression, and the government needed more power to counteract the alleged inherent instability of the free market, meant that the Federal Reserve System's failure produced a political environment favorable to giving them greater control over banks. This is what happens every time government fails. They take more power. What the hell? How absurd is that? In a market system, if you fail, you're out of business. You're gone. Nobody's going to give you money anymore. That's not what happens in the government. You fail, you reward it with greater budgets and more power. Right? And that's what happened with the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve started getting more and more power already in the 1930s and kept getting more power for the next several decades. But the thing is that pretty much all economists now agree with Friedman. He was incredibly influential in this regard. There is nothing in the operation of the free markets that necessitates depressions or even severe recessions. Right? Um, the cause of all such occurrences is mismanaged government policies. Now, that's really played out in 2008. And there are a lot of people that started saying, aha, no, 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 this is the market fault. But in fact, it is not. I mean, that's a whole different lecture. But it's very much connected to this. So I'm going to end with this slide. Um, ben Bernanke, chair of the Federal Reserve until two years ago, right? Um, ben Bernanke was... Um, an expert on the Great Depression. He was heavily influenced by Milton Friedman. And for Milton Friedman's 90th birthday, uh, they threw a bash. There was a huge bash, you know, a massive amount of influential economists and policymakers came to it. And people gave talks in his honor, right, saying, acknowledging all of his contributions. And they got Bernanke, who at that time, he was a very uh, established academic, but at that time he was not the chairman yet of the Federal Reserve. He was a governor, which is a pretty high position, right? There are only six governors, um, uh, seven governors in the Federal Reserve. And, um, and he was speaking on behalf of the Federal Reserve as an expert on the Great Depression. And he examined the Friedman Schwartz hypothesis that the Federal Reserve was responsible for causing the Great Depression. Look at his quote. This is how he finished his talk. Let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you're right. We did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. How many times do you see a quote like this? <laughs> Never. Right? And here you have 
the future chairman of the Federal Reserve taking responsibility for the Great Depression. Keep that in mind anytime somebody tries to convince you that the market is inherently unstable and causing the Great Depression. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you.